the uh, uh, but a little bit of background. You know, I I spent most of my life, you know, spent life working for the government, and uh, uh, one of the the challenges you have when you work for the government is that the government's very risky. And uh, some of the cooler things that, that one might want to do, governments don't do very well. Uh, and I'll give you an example and I'll kind of lead into what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I was the director of NASA's AIM Research Center for almost 10 years. Uh, and one of my lifelong dreams is that we ought to be thinking about interstellar travel. And, uh, the, uh, about eight years ago, I was in a bar in Washington, D.C., probably where I spent too much time, uh, with a colleague of mine that was one of the senior officials at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. And uh, after about the third beer, he and I decided that, you know, it's about time we look at interstellar travel. And, and so we, uh, he said, as a, as a DARPA office director, uh, it was uh, Dave Knight in front of him, who was the head of the office that did space stuff. Uh, he said he could put a million dollars in the thing without getting permission. I said, well, NASA's less rich. Uh, as a center director, I could put 100000 in without getting caught. And uh, so we, we decided we would start something called the 100-Year Starship Project. And uh, the idea was uh, we would, you know, look at the technology, the economics, uh, you know, how do you sustain a long-term effort, where it may take a, a century to to develop things to, to do interstellar travel. And uh, so we got together some study groups and, uh, and then we decided we would have a, a major meeting and invite people. Well, unfortunately I talked about this the wrong way and, and so it got in the press in a viral manner. And I had one of these phone calls from the NASA administrator that I had to hold the phone out. Uh, I was a retired Air Force One star general, and he was a retired Marine Two star. Whenever a senior general calls a junior general general, you know you're in trouble. Um, so that kind of ended that and said, all right, the NASA name comes off that conference you're going to have, but you'll go ahead and have it. And a couple weeks later, my friend at DARPA got in similar trouble. He eventually did get fired. <laughs> and, so the DARPA name came off for the conference. So we had a conference in Florida with about a thousand people sponsored by no one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it did ignite a long-standing uh, interest. Uh, and the other thing, I've always, uh, I'm an astronomer by background. And uh, uh, if, if you go to San Francisco and, a, and there aren't any fires around, uh, you can see a mountain to the east, it's Mount Hamilton. And on top of that mountain is, a, is an observatory, it's Lick Observatory. Uh, it was built in the 1870s by, uh, it was funded by the then richest man in California, James Lick. Uh, and uh, the, uh, he was getting older and he wanted to leave a legacy. And his first idea was to build a 500 foot tall pyramid at downtown San Francisco. <laughs> An idea that wasn't well received by the city fathers. Uh, and they suggested, or somebody did, why don't you build an observatory instead? You know, the world's biggest observatory. And he thought that was a great idea, but when he consulted the learned astronomers, they said, well, you know, downtown San Francisco is probably not the best place. For an observatory, there's the stuff called fog and some other things. And, 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 and so it was decided to put it on a nearby mountaintop. And it turned out it was the first really big observatory in Long Island. And uh, uh, so he spent the equivalent of about a billion and a half dollars uh, in current dollars and built the world's largest telescope. Uh, if you go up there, I suggest you go visit. It's a really beautiful telescope. It's a 36 inch refractor. Uh, he's buried in the pier of the telescope. And in fact, if you get somebody to give you a tour, some smart ass grad student that stuck a plastic skull, and when you kind of look down to see the tomb, you can see the skull. <laughs> but, uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, as an astronomer, it was clear to me that a lot of really cool stuff was done, uh, and still is. Uh, most of uh, America's large telescopes are privately funded, at least in part. Uh, so I've always had the view that we could get private funding for things. And so, 
being the director of NASA Ames, right in the middle of Silicon Valley, in fact, our campus was right next to some small startup, Giggle or Google or something. <laughs> uh, so I got to know the, uh, you know, the founders, and you know, and I, and I was the senior U.S. government employee in, in Silicon Valley, so I started to get invited to A-list parties. And, uh, and by the way, they're not sex parties. Despite <laughs> what you know, the Silicon Valley TV shows suggest. Uh, at least I didn't get it. But, <laughs> but the uh, uh, it, it got to know a number of those folks, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, a couple things happened, and I finally found a billionaire that wanted to fund starships yeah, and a lot of other things. I'll tell you about that here in a second. Uh, so the uh, you know I think that. The main message is that there's really cool stuff going on uh, that in, in the best tradition of America that's, that's privately funded, but it's in partnership with the government. Uh, but uh, let, let me kind of, with that background, start with this story. The, the, my first involvement with the Breakthrough Prize Foundation was uh, in 2012. My uh, <coughs> chief of staff came in and she told me, uh, You'll never guess who's out here to see you. I said, I probably wouldn't. She yeah. said, it's Vanity Fair. And I said, oh, am I the best rest center director? And she said, no, no, you're probably near the bottom. Uh, the, uh, uh, that, uh, but it turns out that, uh, uh, that in 2011, Yuri Milner, uh, who's a, uh, a Russian billionaire, uh, is a, and is a physicist by background, had, uh, it was based in Silicon Valley. He'd, uh, he likes to look at lists of things. And he was looking at lists of who's the most admired people on the planet. And he was dismayed to find that these lists, few if any of them have scientists on the list. And maybe Einstein, Hawking perhaps. Uh, and uh, so he figured as a rich guy would is maybe we can do something about it. So he decided to give him the world's largest science prize. And so he started the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, uh, $3 million. It's, uh, Three times the size of a Swedish prize. I'm not supposed to mention. <laughs> uh, and but then they want they were the the he enlisted Vanity Fair to decide to uh, to, to have the uh, venue for the ceremony in Silicon Valley, uh, and they decided where to have it was uh, on the campus of Mass Ames. Uh, if you're if you if you go to Silicon Valley and drive down 101, you'll see these giant airship hangars from the 30s, and. Uh, uh, they thought that was a neat place to hold the ceremony, uh, and uh, uh, so they made arrangements with NASA to do that. Uh, we've now held there for about six or seven years. Uh, Milner got some of his colleagues, like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Sergey Brin, uh, Jack Ma from China, and now Pony Ma, and uh, uh, and Whiskey uh, to add that. So we now give uh, five. $3 million prizes in life sciences, and one in mathematics, and one in physics. And uh, the ceremony is held each year. Uh, it's a really cool ceremony. Uh, uh, this year we had uh, former 007 as the MC, uh, Chris Brosnan. And uh, we, we really try to make movie stars out of the science, to, you know, A-list entertainers. But the, the awards are presented by a, a billionaire and a movie star. And, uh, it's a really cool thing. It's broadcast live. Uh, we just held a few weeks ago. Uh, the, uh, and I was the landlord, so I got invited. Uh, <laughs> I got to know these guys pretty well. Uh, this year, I'm really proud to say uh, uh, this was uh, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Uh, she was the actual discoverer of the Pulsar. She uh, was a graduate student at uh, Cambridge University. But at the time, uh, both because she was a graduate student and frankly because she was a woman, she didn't get the prize. Uh, her advisors got the prize. Uh, this was, a, I think, in many people's view, a, uh, something needed to be remedied. Uh, she went on to have a distinguished career in science, uh, so we gave her a special breakthrough prize in physics uh, for her lifetime of work, and, and it was really a, a pretty cool effort. Really honored to be part of an organization that could kind of remedy a mistake made by a certain Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but uh, the, uh, uh, the and, and just a, a little more about the prizes. We also give uh, early career prizes in physics and math, a hundred thousand dollar prize. And, and one that I find really cool is partly because I chair the selection committee is we have a junior challenge for high school students between the ages of uh, 13 and 18, and we ask uh, these people to do a short film about some science principle in physics, math, or, uh, or biology. Uh, the winner gets a $250,000 scholarship, wherever they go. Uh, there's a uh, $150,000 science lab we built for the high school. And what I think is kind of cool is the teacher that inspired this young person gets a $50,000 check. The first year we did it, the student didn't tell the teacher, so when we called up and asked where we send your $50,000 check, his next question was, is this a call from Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then they get invited to the ceremony. Uh, and and, and it, these are the winners uh, to date. Uh, uh, and, and it's really global. The first year was a young man from the U.S. Uh, the, the next year, the year was a co-winner, a, a young lady from Singapore, and a young lady from Peru. The next year was a young lady from the Philippines, and this year we gave it to a young man from India. Uh, by the way, if you were going to do a startup, I would start with these five people. It would probably be the world's best startup. I mean, my, my experience has been that the more diverse group that you have, the better. So uh, uh, I'm just really impressed. Uh, by the way, the winner this year is trying to determine whether he wants to go to MIT or Stanford. Uh, the, uh, I told him if, if the weather matters, go to Stanford. <laughs> Turn now to the to the to the, the I think the real reason I came to work uh, uh, for the uh, foundation. Although I'm the chairman of the foundation, I don't have a lot to do with the prizes, uh, the, the, the committees that do that. Uh, but uh, uh, Yuri Milner was aware that I almost got fired for this under their star thing, and when I I, I got him to come over to our Senate. We have a Kepler mission. I'll talk a little about the Kepler mission later. It's a mission that really showed that essentially every star in the galaxy has a planetary system. Uh, it was an Ames mission. And uh, uh, I had in mind him funding a small satellite <coughs> to see if we could find Earth sized planets around Alpha Centauri, which, by the way, he is funding. Uh, but before he got back in his limo, he said, By the way, I want to help you build your starship. So it didn't take long for me to say, tell NASA where to go and decide to go work on, on uh, these initiatives. And the initiatives, uh, and I'll talk about them, there's a couple hundred million now committed to them, there's more coming. Uh, but there's three big questions. And uh, uh, th these are, to my mind, the coolest science questions. Uh, and not necessarily in these orders, but uh, is there any life beyond the Earth at all? Is there intelligent life elsewhere? Uh, and we can sort of leave the question, is there intelligent life here? <laughs> <laughs> I lived in Washington far too long. <laughs> uh, and maybe, you know, maybe my own personal view is, can we travel between the stars? Uh, I, I might add that I graduated from University of Michigan in 1971. That really dates me. Uh, a local newspaper did a little article, you know, this, this local kid makes good. And they, uh, uh, they said, this young man thinks that in his lifetime will be sending probes to the nearest star. And uh, my father, who's still alive, he's almost 98, about a year ago, showed me that article. He said, well, at least you're consistent. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, let me, you know, and I'm not a biologist, but let me talk a little bit about some of the biological factors, <coughs> which I think is important. Uh, the uh, all life on Earth is one of two forms of life. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's either a, what's called a prokaryote, which is a bacteria, uh, archaea, or prokaryotes. These are very simple life forms, maybe not so simple, but they have a, a rather simple genome, typically a few million DNA base pairs. Uh, we pretty much know what most of those the, the genetic construction does. Uh, the, uh, then the other kind of life on Earth are eukaryotes, which are generally much larger, uh, have 
genomes that are, that are, that are hundreds of millions, if not billions of DNA base pairs were eukaryotes. Uh, that uh, the, <coughs> the, the cell is characterized by far more energy production and usage. Uh, so there's a lot more information content. Uh, again, all life on Earth is, is, uh, is either eukaryote or prokaryote. Initially, or, or in addition, prokaryotes, which probably emerged about 500 million years after the Earth was formed, have two subcategories <coughs> that differ primarily in the sort of chemistry of the, of the, of the cell coat. Uh, uh, the, and, and what's kind of interesting, the, the second category, archaea, we didn't even know that existed until about 30 years ago. So half of the microbial life on Earth is completely, was completely unknown. It's, uh, but what the current sort of view is, is that sometime, you know, about a billion years ago, give or take a few hundred billion years, that a, a prokaryote, uh, an archaea, uh, ingested, in fact, it probably ingested a lot, but ingested bacteria and formed a symbiosis. And what the symbiosis was is the bacteria uh, became energy producing uh, components within the cell uh, and uh, the, they became what are now called mitochondria and uh, animal cells uh, or chloroplast plant cells. Uh, but the interesting thing is by incorporating this symbiosis it allowed the amount of energy available to the cell to go up by a factor of thousand. And since information is energy, this allowed the complexity of the cells to go way up, uh, which allowed multicellular organisms and eventually uh, very sophisticated organisms uh, and, and intelligence. So if this is what happens elsewhere, which we have no idea, uh, there's a couple alternatives. Uh, the first one is that life, you know, the initial life formation was a very singular event. There might not be much life elsewhere in the universe. Uh, in this case, we are very much alone, uh, which is an interesting philosophical view. It may increase the, our responsibility. Uh, the second alternative is, uh, uh, is that life is common. These, these prokaryotic kind of organisms are common. But the symbiosis was a rare event. It might have been only singular. In that case, we'll find life everywhere in the universe, but we'll find intelligent life only. And we may be also very alone. The third possibility is life is common and the symbiosis is common, and that we may find intelligence everywhere. So, part of our initiative is to figure that out. Now, another interesting thing, and this is something we're just beginning to, to, to look at, and I just want to leave it as a thought, is that we're getting <coughs> close to understanding that what that initial organism on Earth looked like, and it, it's called. LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, LUCA was a very sophisticated organism. Uh, it had maybe 500 genes. Uh, we have a pretty good idea what they were. We know what most of them do. Well, about two thirds we know what they do. Uh, but that the interesting thing is that uh, that uh, uh, it was probably too sophisticated to have evolved in a few hundred million years on Earth. So this leads to a concept that, that is very arguable that life came from elsewhere. That, uh, that life in the universe may be 10 billion years old, four and a half. Uh, and there's various pieces of evidence that suggest that. Uh, so that we're all aliens at some point. Uh, so this is one of the things we want to explore. Now, there's another concept which I think is kind of cool. Uh, the uh, uh, Crick, who was one of the uh, Swedish Prize winners for DNA, uh, in 1973, along with another British chemist, Earl Gell, uh, suggested that that the life here was it came from elsewhere, but it was also seeded by intelligence. This is an interesting paper. Uh, the, there hasn't been a lot of looking at this, but I, I, in about a week and a half, we're going to have an initial conference at Harvard uh, where we're going to look at the idea that, again, was it C 
seated, and is there is it possible that there's a message left in the channel? So, you know, so you can go through your message. And of course, there's been a few movies about this, so. <laughs> but uh, but but anyway, I think this is this is a very interesting set of questions. Uh, so we're having a lot of fun. But let, let me now turn to the to the initiatives. Uh, the initiatives were announced uh, uh, on July 20th, uh, uh, 2015, in the Royal Society of London. Uh, that's Yuri Milner, who's uh, our principal sponsor, and Stephen Hawking, who was our senior scientific advisor uh, <coughs> till his death. Uh, the first initiative was address the intelligent question. Uh, SETI is an old, uh, old, fairly old idea. It was first scientifically looked at in the late 50s, where the, it was found that, that radio waves at about one and a half gigahertz will penetrate through much of the galaxy. Uh, and so it was suggested that if somebody wanted to signal us across the galaxy, that they would use uh, radio waves in this sort of frequency range, uh, and people begin to look for them. Uh, I want to emphasize SETI is not you know, alien abductions. Although that's kind of cool. <laughs> I did live in the backwoods of New Mexico for a while, where some of the alien, you know, dissections occurred, so I never saw any. Uh, but what it is, is that we've, there had, there's been sporadic work, almost all of it privately funded on SETI, uh, although there was a government program until the early 1990s. It was at NASA Ames. Uh, but the idea is to, is to use initially primarily radio telescopes. Uh, so the, we've committed $100 million for a 10-year project. Uh, we've purchased basically 20% of the time on this radio telescope. This is the 100-meter uh, the, the, uh, radio telescope at Greenback, West Virginia. It's the world's largest steered antenna. Uh, I mean, that's as big as a football field, so it's a pretty cool telescope. Uh, we've also got 25% of the time uh, of this radio telescope in the southern hemisphere. Uh, it's a 64 meter radio telescope at Parks. Uh, and it, actually this is kind of a cool historical instrument. It was the same dish that was used to receive the Apollo 11 moon log. And in fact, there's a really cute movie called The Dish. If you, if you've never seen it, that one. It's also a family friendly movie. It starts with the, with the, with the, the crew playing cricket inside the dish. Um, I had to go up there and take a cricket bat. So, uh, we also are beginning to look at optical signals, uh, recognizing that increasingly we're not using radio signals. Laser signals will also penetrate. In fact, actually, probably a lot easier than optical signals. Uh, so we're using this is an instrument, the Automated Planet Finder at Lick Observatory. Uh, by the way, that it's not the instrument with the laser beam on it. That's the Lick 120 inch. It's a little white dome in the middle. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, this is the uh, world's largest radio telescope. It's a 500 meter, it's just being completed in China. Uh, we have a conference scheduled in a couple of months with, the, with our Chinese colleagues, and we've signed an agreement to use this to start looking for signals. And, and by the way, this is the only instrument on Earth that you, you, you might have heard this, well, it should be easy to hear radio signals because we've been broadcasting I Love Lucy into space since the 50s. Uh, if there were aliens on the nearest star broadcasting I Love Gork, uh, <laughs> this is the first radio telescope that's big enough to actually pick it up. So it's kind of you know, radio, you know, broadband, uh, non-directional signals. So they would have to direct them to be detected. Uh, we're also using, this is the Jago Bank 74 meter. This was built in the 1950s. It was the first modern radio telescope. It's connected with a network around the UK. Or, uh, uh, and then this is the newest radio telescope. Uh, we've just signed an agreement with the South African government. Uh, the, uh, the, eventually, there'll be 2,000 of these dishes. It'll have the equivalent of a square kilometer collecting power over all of Southern Africa. Uh, the first 64 are finished. Uh, the power of this is because it's an array telescope can be electronically steered. Uh, we're intending to look at, see if there's signals from the million nearest stars. That's out, it's a complete sample out to about a thousand light years. We think that's probably the maximum range that, with the technology we can imagine, would be able to detect there's some civilization on Earth. So that's the, the program that 
today. Uh, the second project, uh, which is I guess the one I'm really personally most excited about, is Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, this is a, an attempt to, within a few decades, send a probe to the nearest star, uh, the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, the, uh, uh, this was uh, announced uh, on uh, April 12, 2016, at the New World Trade Center in Washington, D.C., that, uh, again, Miller and Hawking primary announcement. The first question, is there any place interesting to go? Uh, and I would have said when I went to graduate school centuries ago, uh, the answer was we didn't, you know, if you ask an astronomer, was there planets or any other stars, they'd say maybe one in a thousand. Uh, at that time it was believed there was some weird, you know, event that the sun crashed into something else and material was scattered. Uh, but the Kepler mission was a mission that is just completed here a, a month ago. Uh, and the mission was a modest sized one meter uh, optical telescope that looked at a region of the sky a, a few square uh, degrees. It's kind of about the size if you hold your fist up. Uh, and we looked at about 150,000 stars like the sun. And, uh, and we were looking for shadows. If a planet passed in front of the star, it would have a signal of about a few, a few tens of millions of, of uh, light reduction uh, that would show the evidence of a planet. Uh, we were able to show that essentially every star in the galaxy has a planetary system. About a quarter of the stars like the sun <coughs> appear to have a planet like the Earth in the habitable zone, meaning that there would be liquid water on the surface. Uh, pretty neat result. That, that work is being continued with the MIT Harvard test instrument that was launched about six months ago uh, to look at all the nearby stars to see if there's uh, uh, transiting planets. Uh, another recent result was this is TRAPPIST-1, which is a, 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 a solar type stars. That most of the stars in the galaxy are red dwarf stars. Or stars about a tenth the mass of the sun and maybe a 10,000 for light output. Uh, TRAPPIST-1 has seven planets the size of the Earth orbiting on three of them in the half of the zone. Uh, the, uh, it, we, we now, it looks like essentially every one of these red dwarf stars seems to have Earth-sized planets. So the places that might have life are, are a lot. Uh, by the way, uh, if you want to know what, what TRAPPIST-1 system was named after, it turns out it's beer. <laughs> the astronomers at, at, at Liège, uh, you know, the University of Liège, were drinking practice beer and decided to name it. <laughs> astronomers do have a sense of humor sometimes. Uh, now the question is, can we go there? Uh, this is Voyager, Voyager for those of you who have watched old science fiction movies. Uh, it's the fastest thing that we've sent to date, the farthest at least. It's 130 astronomical units, 130 times the distance of the Earth's sun away. At the speed it's going, it would get to the nearest star in about 80,000 years if it was aimed in the right direction. So probably not going to fund those kind of things. Uh, so what do we need to do? Well, the, uh, if our objective is to send the, hopefully the nearest star, but maybe the other ones that have planets, uh, we'd like to take science data uh, and we'd like to launch within 30 years and get there within a few decades. So the answer, the technical answer, is to go really fast. Uh, so can we do that? And the speed we need to go is about 20% the speed of light. It's about a thousand times faster than anything we've done today. Uh, the, the question is, can we increase the speed in the next few decades? And, uh, I note that in the middle of the 20th century, we did that. Uh, so the question is, can we do that now? And uh, uh, the uh, when we set up our program, we set up an advisory committee. Uh, I told some of you, Avi Loeb chairs it, uh, the, the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard. We had a number of other you know, kind of distinguished experts, including some that won that Swedish prize. And uh, we looked at a lot of different ideas, you know, uh, you know that were in the literature and talked about. Most of them were baloney. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, just to give you an idea that in engineering schools, the, the, I do put an equation up. It's only one. Uh, the, uh, the 
rocket equation, uh, that uh, the, 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 the key parameter of the rocket equation is the specific impulse, which basically tells you the, the, the fuel's capability. So the, uh, how much exhaust speed you get for how much fuel. And uh, uh, it's in inverse seconds. Uh, a typical rocket today, using chemical fuel, has a specific impulse of three to 400. Uh, if you run this equation through and say, well, I want to go to Alpha Centauri in a reasonable amount of time, uh, in a reasonable size rocket, what do you need for specific impulse? And it turns out you need about a million. So again, a factor of a thousand. Uh, so, you know, can we do that? Uh, and, uh, you know, the answer is like, this is really tough. Uh, just to give you, I mean, you can do the, well, the calculation with chemical fuel. You find, yes, you can build a rocket that will go to Alpha Centauri and get you 20% speed of light. The mass of fuel is about the mass of the galaxy, so <laughs> <laughs> let that one go. Uh, I, I will say that, that, that nuclear fission, particularly fusion, nuclear fusion gets you a specific impulse if you make it work for a few hundred thousand. So you're starting to get in the range. The trouble with fusion is it's, you know, you know I, it, it, it's, uh, it's sort of the old joke that it's, uh, it's the energy source of the future, always has been, always will be. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> although I'm, I'm intrigued that, in so way that there are some fusion developments that might make it possible. Of course, if you watch Star Trek, what I really like is antimatter. And, and we got very excited about antimatter. If you can do a, this is, this is a picture from a NASA study a few years ago. Uh, that if you could actually make and store antimatter, the, the specific impulse is about 8 million, so you've got plenty to spare. Uh, the trouble is making and storing it. Uh, you can make it, I think we made up to like 10 to the 14th antiprotons a year in the uh, Fermilab uh, accelerator. Uh, storing it is also a little tricky. Uh, the, uh, but there were some ideas on how to use it to uh, and we got very excited about this, except that, that, to my embarrassment, I didn't catch the error. Ed Witten, one of our uh, breakthrough winners, looked at it and said, you know, there's an eight-order magnitude mistake in their calculations. So don't take everything NASA does at face value. Uh, but, I, I mean, it's, uh, we've probably got about 14 orders of magnitude improvement through before antimatter makes sense. Uh, but the, uh, the, there is a technology that does seem to make sense. It's a very old one. Uh, that if you could leave the power source behind uh, and, and actually use what sailboats do, you probably can sail the stars. And I will say this is also a very old idea. Uh, there is a letter that uh, Kepler wrote to Galileo in 1610 suggesting using heavenly winds uh, to sail into, into space. Uh, we're not quite sure what he had in mind. <laughs> there isn't much more in the letter. <laughs> I think he, he, do, he does tell Galileo that, that, that he'll have Galileo do the, do the figuring out how to do the sailing. He just thought it was a good idea. Uh, now, we think we might know a way to do it, and it's light sails. Uh, light sails have been demonstrated. Uh, this is a picture, I think, from the... Uh, a privately funded effort by the, by the uh, uh, Planetary Society. Uh, the Japanese have also done light sails. Uh, the trouble with a light sail is you use sunlight, and sunlight's pretty dilute. And if you want to sail around the solar system at, you know, maybe even 100 kilometers a second, so factor 10 faster than your day, this makes sense. But we want to go 1,000 times faster. So when we, uh, our result was, uh, if we could make a really small spacecraft and we could make a really powerful light beam using a laser, uh, then we might be able to make this work. And uh, uh, I'll tell you that the, 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 the spacecraft is really small. I got one in my pocket. This is a Starship. Uh, this was a prototype built by uh, Mason Peck at Cornell. Uh, we've launched some of these, so they, they, the technology is coming along. Uh, but the laser has to be really big. Now, this is a very bad artist conception. Uh, we try to tell the artist that laser beam directors don't look like radio telescopes. <laughs> this is really big. It's a kilometer square. Uh, if we 
going to Alpha Centauri, which is only visible in the Southern Hemisphere, this would have to be in the Southern Hemisphere. And when we made our announcement, they asked where we went to put it. We said, well, the best place is the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, now, we neglected to tell the Chilean government. Uh, so I have been summoned to Chile. I've talked to the previous president, the current president. Uh, they, are like, they like the idea now, but there's sort of a message that do talk to the heads of states and countries and want to put any things. One reason I was in Bhutan, that's another location. The king likes that idea. Uh, but uh, uh, the things that make this really difficult <coughs> is that, uh, that and, and the idea is that you put one of these chips and attach it to a light sail about four meters in diameter. You have a really powerful 100 gigawatt laser. You hit it when it's in space for about 10 minutes and accelerate a few tens of thousands of Gs and you're going at 20% speed of light coast all the way to the nearest star system. Uh, easy. Uh, but, but there are a couple developments that, that, that make this feasible. One is the, the ability to pack a lot in a very small package. The second is communications technologies developing lasers that we can gang together, millions of them. Uh, indeed, there is sort of a Moore's Law for lasers. But the cost per watt of lasers is going down in kind of a long linear fashion, and the power is going up. If you extrapolate this trend, and it seems we're still on it, uh, uh, that within a decade we'll be able to build 100 gigawatt lasers for the kind of tens of billions of dollars that are kind of feasible. Uh, spacecraft is the second uh, issue. Of course, this is a typical concept today, a few metric tons. Uh, we now can do a lot of these things as a kilogram class spacecraft, but we'd like to go another three orders of magnitude. Uh, but if you think about what's in an Apple Watch, it does everything, or most things that spacecraft does. So, so we came up with a star chip idea. Uh, this is the one I showed you. Uh, I, I did get my staff member with the biggest finger, so it was really small. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, we have launched these. Uh, this is Zach Manchester, who's a, a faculty member at Stanford. He was a, a postdoc at Harvard here last year, and uh, uh, he developed a prototype of these things, about four grams. Uh, we launched the first one a year ago on Latvia's first satellite. We also neglected to tell the Latvian government it was on their satellite. <laughs> <laughs> Another mistake I did not do. Uh, the next one to get launched here, and I, I, I think it may be on the, on the booster that's sitting on the launch pad now, it keeps being delayed. Uh, but it'll launch uh, about 100 of these on small satellite. So this technology is coming along quite well. Uh, and then we can see the, uh, the, the, the next one to be launched. So the idea is that you attach the, the star chip to the light sail. Not like this, by the way. Uh, but uh, what we've done is 100 million uh, committed to this effort uh, over the next uh, five to seven years. Uh, uh, if that works, we would like to build a small Billion dollar class prototype uh, to, uh, to demonstrate everything. Uh, ultimately, we hope to be in the like, ten to a few tens of billions of dollar level. It would be a public private partnership. This would be a comparable investment to sort of the CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider or maybe the International Space Station. Uh, so, this year, we've uh, our initial uh, efforts, we have uh, just completed about a dozen initial research contracts, which about 100,000 each uh, uh, in a year. We'll down select to a few multi-million dollar efforts to develop the laser devices. The second big problem that we have is making uh, materials that, uh, that can take this much power and uh, not burn up. Uh, the, uh, the person leading this is Professor Harry Atwater at, uh, at Caltech. Uh, we are about to write about a dozen contracts on this. It looks fairly promising. The third big problem, and I think the biggest one, is how do you communicate back from Alpha Centauri, which is 300,000 astronomical units away. Uh, we can wave our hands. In fact, Avi Loeb did this. He did the theoretical calculation. If you put a small laser in that chip, a pulse laser, and that, that prototype has a laser that size on it, uh, and you're able to kind of use the light sail as a focusing device, uh, that's another. <laughs> Or you have to deploy something when you're there. Uh, and then you aim it back at the Earth and lock on, or you'd have to aim at the sun and offset where the Earth is going to be in four years. 
and uh, uh, use that transmitter as a receiver or build something comparable, uh, then you can get a few, maybe up to a kilobit per second. So it's just doable theoretically, uh, but we need to start actually doing the development. Uh, so, so those are the three long poles that we will do. Uh, of course, the next question is, like I said, is there any place to go? Uh, we now know there's a lot of planets, uh, but we'd really like to find something in the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, Alpha Centauri is, uh, is 4.3 light years away. There are three stars in the system. Uh, two of them are about the size of the sun. Uh, they orbit each other in about 80 years. Uh, the third one is a very distant star, the red, the red dwarf star, Proxima Centauri. It wasn't even recognized as being part of the system until about 50 years ago. Uh, we made our announcement, as I said, in, in, in April of 2016, without knowing anything, any planets in the Alpha Centauri system. Fortunately, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, the European Southern Observatory, a few months later, in August, announced the discovery of a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri in the habitable zone. Uh, they were nice enough to invite me to the press conference. We've been nice enough to give them a bunch of money. <laughs> yeah. uh, of course, they have a picture of it already, so I guess we don't need What we funded uh, them to do was build what's called a, it's a 10 micron coronagraph. It blocks out the, the Alpha Centauri A and B and looks to see if we can directly image the planet. Uh, it's about to be shipped to, to, the, to these telescopes. There's four 8 meter telescopes from Chile. Uh, so we, hopefully we can directly image a planet. Uh, we're also doing some spacecraft efforts to uh, see if we can find one. Uh, of course, the really definitive effort, this is the European Extremely Large Telescope. It's one of three really big ones being built. Now, I'm embarrassed as an astronomer about how we name these things. This was the very large telescope. <laughs> this was the extremely large telescope. <laughs> Now, no shit, it was originally called the overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> ELT, there's the TMT, and the GMT. So the, 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 the uh, 30 meter telescope and the giant Magellan telescopes. Maybe you become astronomers, do something a little different. Uh, we're also looking at building a small satellite to see if we can directly measure the position of one of the Alpha Centauri stars relative to the other one within a millionth of an arc second. If we can do that, we'll be able to see the wobble caused by a planet so we can measure the mass as well as the position. This is a program we're working with the Italian Space Agency. Uh, the, uh, I will say that we're finding more and more planets. This is the next nearest star system, Barnum Star. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the European Southern Observatory announced there's a planet orbiting it, not in the habitable zone, but we're seeing planets everywhere. Of course, they have a picture of it, too. Uh, the last project, uh, which we, we're still looking at, is looking in our own solar system for life. Uh, of course, the obvious place is Mars. Uh, you know, really cool if NASA landed there again. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, I think there's probably going to be life underneath the surface. There's evidence of, of water processes, so that, uh, that's a good place to look. But there are other exciting places. Uh, this is the, one of the inner moons of Saturn, Enceladus. Uh, when the Cassini mission went there, it discovered that there is uh, there are geysers of water. In fact, it appears to be seawater uh, blowing into space. Uh, the Cassini mission was able to determine there are complex molecules, organic molecules in that water. Uh, one of the possibilities is can we send a privately funded mission to, to with a mass spectrometer and see if we can figure out is it you know is there really complicated molecules, DNA, RNA, and so forth. So we're, we have a design to look at that. Uh, my favorite place to look for life is this. This is Venus. Uh, you know, first, when we went to Venus, first we discovered the surface. Is, uh, it really sucks. It kind of is the weather. <laughs> Tucson, Arizona, when I went to graduate school, 500 degrees centigrade on the surface. Uh, but it turns out, in the upper atmosphere of Venus, at uh, about 50 kilometers, the uh, temperature and pressure is about what it is in this room. Now, there's a minor issue of sulfuric acid clouds, 
Uh, but sulfuric acid is actually fairly positive for life. And if you go to that, uh, especially the uh, uh, archaea lives in sulfuric acid fumaroles and so on. Uh, there is a mysterious ultraviolet absorption feature that's consistent with photosynthetic pigments. Uh, so we're looking at a privately funded mission to, to, uh, to drop something into that layer and see if there's life there. Uh, you might recognize this guy is John Brunsfeld, who's an astronaut that rescued Hubble, uh, astronomer, and uh, the former head of science at NASA. He's now working with us. Uh, he believes that probably the best place is Europa, the, the, the one of the large moons of Jupiter that also shows geysers of water spraying in space. Uh, so we are looking at one of these three places, or maybe all three, uh, with privately funded missions. Uh, you know, and again, like I said, the, you know, our ultimate target is, is the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, last, we have an annual conference uh, that. Uh, Last two years we've called it Stanford. This next year we're going to hold it at Berkeley because the bars are better here at Berkeley. Uh, but uh, we've invited the, you know, we're working with, these are the heads of science of most of the world space agencies. And uh, we're working closely with the uh, space agencies. We've just signed agreements with NASA. Uh, we're about to sign an agreement with the Italian Space Agency and uh, other European space agencies. So we've got agreements with the, with the, uh, with the Chinese. Uh, science agencies, so really trying to, to do a public-private partnership. So if all goes well, in 50 years or so, we might have our first image of a flyby of another planet, another star system, and maybe we can answer the questions. Mm -hmm. Let me stop there. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions, and uh, hopefully a lot of you will come and work with us on this stuff. Cool stuff. Thanks. that NASA and DARPA were unimpressed with you and your colleagues' efforts to, to start this, but um, at the end of the, on your last slide, you said you had an agreement with NASA to investigate these things. Uh, can you talk about what, what were the issues that NASA didn't like or felt um, unsupportable, uh, and what has changed or has anything changed? Well, I think that, you know, government agencies are, you know, Big bureaucracies. Uh, the uh, NASA is particularly responsible to you know 500 odd boards of directors, members of Congress, and uh, frankly, it's kind of a welfare agency. You know, it, it, uh, uh, a lot of the projects are are there because of jobs. Uh, if there's a new project that somebody proposes, especially one that may eventually be expensive. It means some old project doesn't get done. And so there's a lot of resistance. I mean, I, one of my favorite quotes is the one from Machiavelli and the Prince that says that something to the effect, the hardest thing to do is to change the order of things because everybody that has something to gain by the new order will be lukewarm supporters, and those that have something to lose will be your vicious enemies. So trying to push a new thing that may eventually cost a lot of money is usually going to be resistant uh, pretty hard. So I think that's the, the challenge. It also means that a government agency is very risk averse. Uh, I'll give you an example: is that you know NASA for a while was doing SETI work, but Congress said, "Well, this is a ridiculous waste of money." It stopped it in the early 1990s, uh, and it, there's probably a good reason for that. When, when we made our announcement, uh, Yuri Milner asked, the, you know, "We had a group of you know distinguished scientists." And, Experts, including uh, Martin Rees, who was the former, was the astronomer royal of the UK and former head of the Royal Society. And Yuri asked him, "What do you think the likelihood of us finding intelligent signals in the next decade is?" I think most of us said tenth of a percent, one percent, two percent at most. I think that was mine as I was trying to get some. And uh, so then we asked Yuri what he thought his. He said, "Well, ten of the minus fifth. And so I got thinking. If I had gone to the U.S. government and said I want $100 million and the likelihood of success was 1% at best, and probably more like 10 to the minus fifth, you know, how far do you think I would have got? <laughs> and so I think that that's 
privately funded efforts can take a lot more risk. Uh, once we get started and things begin to look interesting and feasible, then you find the governments are more likely to go along. Particularly now where there's not, a, you know, a lot of money for these kind of cool stuff is, is, is going away. So the, the whole idea of public-private partnerships gives NASA a way to do cool stuff without getting blamed for it. And, uh, and we take the early risk. So we've, we've now found that on these projects that, uh, that they're quite eager to work with us because we've, we've taken the early risk. So, uh, so I think it's, it's going pretty well. Yeah, the back. Yeah, oh, so on the government funding side, have you ever partnered with the military on research projects? Because I know high-powered lasers are the most irrelevant thing to the military. <laughs> It, well, well, I mean, like I said, one of, one of the one of the one of the titles I have is general. Uh, so yes, uh, the uh, indeed the when I was in the Air Force, we uh, we sent a probe to the moon, a military probe called Clementine, and NASA worked with us. Uh, now we had ulterior motives; it was a way to get around the ABM treaty because uh, the ABM treaty says you couldn't do missile defense tests in. in ABM mode, which meant North orbit, but we told the lawyers we're not going to be in North orbit, we're going to be in lunar orbit. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and NASA loved it because they they took scientific instruments on it. So there's quite a little bit of military civilian cooperation but on lasers. Uh, most of the work in the past decades have been done by the military. And in fact, the guy that chaired our committee was the retired scientist that ran the Air Force laser weapons. Fugate. Now, this gets us into kind of a, a dicey issue of export control and who can you work with. Uh, the uh, so we've had to kind of walk a narrow line on things like laser technology, but uh, that uh, it, it's certainly true around the world that a lot of the technology is developed for military purposes. Uh, but we are committed as a private foundation as publishing as much as we're allowed to uh, and being as open as we're allowed to. Uh, uh, the uh, you know certainly I mean one of the the real really sensitive things obviously now is we are working with China uh, on the 500 meter and it's uh, you know I've had to hire a couple of people that are full time export control experts to make sure we don't get in trouble but it's uh, uh, you know this is a project that's going to last for many decades so hopefully you know by the time we get around building something it'll be we're able to, to work together. I mean, the International Space Station is a good example. You know, a lot of sensitive military technologies went into the, to the rocket technology and the control technology and so forth for that. So it's, we're optimistic, but aware there's a lot of effort that we've got to work on. You talked about three of the big focus areas of problem solving, laser power, the materials, and Laser com. It was about thirty other big problems. Yeah, <laughs> but I the one that I'm that, that I'm really interested in. I'd love to hear what you've heard from some of the science brainstorming. I is the optics. You're going to be going through at point two C, so you're going to go through pretty fast. How do you how do you get good quality images? Uh, that's a question, but we think that the, the we're not going to fly that close to the planet. We're probably about a tenth of an astronomical unit. Maybe a hundredth. Uh, so you're 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 in the range where you know you're you're you have to track, uh, but you're not. It's not like you know you're flying by at a few hundred kilometers where it's kind of you know it's gone. Uh, the uh, the technology to do that appears to be well within the you know the, to to clock the photons. Uh, so that the but that was a, was something we looked at, and it's. Uh, you know, again, it depends how close you want to get to the planet. We also don't really want to hit the planet. Uh, the amount of kinetic energy in that grand chip is about the equivalent of a small nuclear weapon. So, uh, <laughs> if, if there's a civilization there, you don't want to hit it. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's about the same amount of energy as a small asteroid that hit the Earth every year. Yeah, so it's, you know, it would be indistinguishable. We may have been hit by star chips. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that's one of the things that we'll have to get in the design. Uh, we can 
probably test it pretty well by, you know, when you start building these chips, flying them close to, you know, you could you could fly by an asteroid to simulate the, the distance you'd be, and, and you track it and, and clock the photons. But yeah, that's one of the challenges. Yeah, you know, speaking of private funding, you know, today NASA announced like these nine companies for carrying stuff to the moon. And just as a plug, I'm an investor in Moon Express, one of them. But in terms of startups, you know, most startups don't have $100 million to do what you guys are doing. What opportunities do you think are there for startups, you know, given that you guys will be at well, you know, contracts I, in the yeah. startup space? Yeah. I think it's important to understand that, you know, one of the things that there's a lot of private investment, and there's uh, one needs to separate investors that are interested in ultimately profit and philanthropic investment. You know, the, the, these are basically philanthropic investments. I mean, Yuri Milner's not looking to make any money on it. He's you know, you know, worth I don't know five billion or so, give or take a billion or two, depending on how Airbnb did this. Week. And uh, <laughs> uh, and you know, I think the same is this like Bezos. You know that. You know, he's interested in, I mean, he told me 20 years ago that he was just selling books so he could build rockets. He sold a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> he could build a lot of rockets. So, the, so I, I think it's important to separate those two. So we're a philanthropic investment. However, there's, I think, a lot of sources of, of, of investment for these technologies. Uh, you know, I, I'm really excited about what you can do with these. And I think there's some real opportunities for investment. I mean, the, the, the amount of money it costs to design one of these things and get it printed out is a few thousand bucks. And the individual chips are, you know, 10 bucks. So, you know, swarms of these can really begin to do some incredible stuff. Uh, the, uh, in fact, we're uh, sponsored by the New Zealand and Australian space agencies. We have a workshop in Auckland, New Zealand in, in March to, uh, to really think and start getting people together, all students can work in some of these. And so I think there's a lot of possibilities. Laser propulsion is another one that uh, I think, you know, if, if we build this photon engine, uh, okay, you can send things interstellar distances, but you can send a lot bigger stuff all around the solar system. So I, I think the whole idea of directed energy and propulsion, even more near term, is light sails. Uh, there are a number of startup companies that are doing light sail. In fact, one of the ones we're funding is one in Poland, who have picked the unfortunate name of Golden Fleece for their, you know, their trying to explain to them that had a double meaning in the U.S. Uh, the, but it was, uh, uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of possibilities in these technologies uh, that, uh, that for, for profit-making companies. And I, uh, the, the other thing is just to give a plug you know, for space stuff. I, you know, I, I the one one of the additional things Yuri allows me to do. I'm an advisor to the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg um, Space Resources, and they have put uh, a couple hundred million euros into that. They they're, have just announced a 80 million euro public-private investment fund. But the private part of it is a U.S. company. Uh, U.S.-based company. So there's, uh, I think there's beginning to be quite a lot of capital available for uh, for pretty speculative stuff, and uh, that, uh, that is available. So it's it's the, the situation is reasonably positive. Uh, you know, the uh, you know obviously there's no profit to be made yet for interstellar travel, but if you want to get it on the ground floor, we're there. <laughs> Uh, what do you think are some of the best ways to become involved in this sort of work? With, with, with what we're doing? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, well, Yuri won't let me hire anybody. Uh, the, uh, there's five of us right now in the central office. Uh, however, uh, you know, we'll probably soon announce who these contracts are. And a lot of our, you know, university groups and, and, uh, and, and laser and optics houses uh, I think the best way is to work with them, you know, and uh, uh, I, I, there might be, I think one of the things is an MIT group, so when we make the announcement, that there's, there's groups at, at universities and, and uh, so forth. So that's, 
that's probably the best way. The other uh, thing is NASA is now beginning to, you know, they initially said this is all stupid, they've now put money into interstellar stuff. Uh, you know, partly because we pushed it. And they're also putting money in SETI efforts. So they had a workshop here a few months ago where they, uh, they invited a bunch of people. So it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the best form of flattery is imitation. But, but I think the, uh, uh, the best way to get involved right now is once we announce we're working on it. But there's a lot of university groups, uh, you know, they're working on some of these technologies here. One of the things I, you know, since you're here in Boston, uh, you should go to talk with Professor Lowe. And I mean, he's got a little working group that works, and we fund them a little bit. Uh, there's also a, a more undergraduate work, but there's a uh, uh, there's summer student opportunities with the, with the SETI group at Berkeley. I think they just announced those. Uh, but uh, there's also you know graduate work, you know, that, that, uh, and support from us and others for you know, uh, masters and PhD in some of these research groups. So, so, uh, but I think there's growing opportunities. Yeah. Um, are there any intermediate science schools? Like, uh, you were saying that this might take like decades, right? So maybe there are some thing you could do before that? Like. Well, well yeah, I mean, a couple. One of them is, of course, we'd like to find the light bearing planet remotely. So there's work that's going on in that, and we're funding some of it, and a lot of it is funded by science space agencies. Uh, the, the other thing is, if we are successful in the basic research program, we're going to try to build a prototype. And, uh, you know, the, that could probably accelerate things to maybe a thousand kilometers a second. And uh, so we're looking at a lot of intermediate, you know, visit things in the outer solar system, uh, the Oort cloud, so forth, and we're in stellar space. There's, there's a mission that, that I'm quite excited about that uh, the Keck Institute has been studying is if you can send a, a you know, a few kilograms to, there's a, uh, if you can get out 500 astronomical units from the sun uh, and you're in the right location, if you, you align the sun with a, something you want to image, the sun acts as a gravitational lens. So you can actually, now it's a line focus, not a point focus, but there are missions that, that you could actually image, you know, planets and be able to see cities and whatever else in principle. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of ifs in that one. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, those, but, but those are uh, even more than we have. Uh, but, but there's a whole set of missions in, that as we move along, we'll start to do a little more analysis on, on what those are. Uh, we are funding a few of these chipset missions. Uh, one of the things that it looks like we're going to do in the next 18 months is a, we're working with OHB Systems. It's a, a company in Bremen, in Germany, that uh, they launched our first chipset for us. And uh, what we're looking at is uh, using chipsets and tethers to kind of start. And that's an interesting idea that uh, where you can stabilize things in our solar system and indeed even use like the Jovian magnetic field to spiral in the uh, Jupiter emissions, the very low cost emissions. So there's that's stuff that we're beginning to look at. So yes, it's quite a little bit. You got a question? Uh, yeah. So what do you see the project management looking like with this going forward? So right now you're funding a bunch of um, research work at universities. It, yeah. Is this are you eventually going to like start a manufacturing base? Well, what, what, what the idea is that the, so let me use the Starshot. The, uh, uh, we'll have probably in the end about 30 research contracts. We'll down select in a year or two to about three or four in each of those. And uh, uh, the, the way we manage those is that uh, we basically use our advisory panels. We have an advisory panel for Starshot with about 30 people. We have a subcommittee for the sale, subcommittee for the laser, and we'll have one for the communications. We'll pay some of them to, to, to oversee these, these efforts. Uh, and then each 
one of the efforts of a principal investigator. So, so this is a research effort. Uh, we have a system engineering, system integrating effort we fund. Uh, got a couple of people that would basically pay full time to do the modeling and maintain that kind of master, master system uh, design. Uh, that uh, as we get closer to finishing the research, uh, uh, we'll have a better idea what that prototype looks like. And at that time, we would probably would have a prime contractor, you know, or university or group. So hopefully, that would be in part funded in concert with more and more government. Uh, and we think that's probably a billion dollar class effort. Uh, the uh, we think much of that can be funded privately. Uh, I, I will mention that Mark Zuckerberg is on our website. But he hasn't put any money in yet, but he does have some. Maybe not so much after legal fights. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but again, there's a lot of interest in, I think, the high net worth people. And, you know, again, we, you know, we're not going to manage, you know, a billion dollar project with five people, so there would, there would have to be some expansion. <coughs> Uh, our other projects uh, for the SETI effort, uh, uh, that's a $100 million 10 year effort. Berkeley is our prime on that, so they got about a dozen people. And uh, again, we have an oversight committee. Uh, we, we write the primary contracts, and that is about it. For the, the what we call Breakthrough Watch, uh, uh, there we have a principal investigator again that. that uh, uh, at the European Southern Observatory, and so they manage that for us. Uh, if we do these missions in the solar system, again, we'll probably, we'll have a PI, which would probably be John Gunsfeld, and then there would be a prime, you know, Lockheed or somebody of that nature. Like right? Lockheed's one of the people we wanted to look at. So, but, you know, that's, that's one of the challenges. You know, again, as a privately funded effort, we don't want to get into the business of having to fund hundreds of thousands of people. One possibility is we just have NASA, you know, or European Space Agency, or, or whatever, and uh, you know, that would be their their mission. I'm curious about, or if you could say a few words about prioritization. So, with the Listen effort, for instance, I imagine you know opportunity is driving you know, the selection of, of what you're using as far as the facilities, yeah. but then. In the search, how do you determine, or what what's going into um, picking out thresholds, for instance, to look for to say, you know, with this smaller telescope, we've looked at that region. We're not interested with the larger telescope, or you know, some of those kinds of questions. Well, that's what we pay Berkeley to do. Okay. Uh, and because not everybody agrees with Berkeley, that's we have an advisory panel, and they can get a little feisty, uh, like any scientific thing. So the the Berkeley people are present their plan to our advisory panel and it gets argued through uh, and you know sometimes it changed. Uh, one of the big concerns we've got with SETI is that most of the effort to debate has been we're looking for signals that look like what we transmitted in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of you know can we do something new and different. Uh, we are potentially going to work with Israeli intelligence. Uh, some of the people that do decryption of signals have shown interest in, in helping us. Uh, uh, I tried to get the US NSA, but nobody will admit they work for the NSA. So, uh, the, uh, uh, even the people I used to know that I knew worked for the NSA. I don't work for the NSA. I used to. I don't work for the NSA. You're supposed to have forgotten everything you used to know. So. But, uh, but I mean, there's a lot of knowledge on how to, how to pull a signal out of noisy data. Uh, what we basically look for today is is a signal that is too narrow to be caused by a natural phenomenon uh, in terms of its frequency and too regular to be by some natural phenomenon. Uh, so it's uh, it correlates in, in, in frequency and space. So it's basically we have to throw most of the data away. We have massive correlation engines that we install in the telescopes. I mean that might not be the best way to do it. So 
one of the things we're trying to do with the, the Parks Radio Telescope is, I mean, there's such a massive quantity of data, we're going to record one scan of the galaxy a year, galactic plane, that we don't throw any data away. We we'll just archive that. So if somebody has some clever idea that we're just going to record the raw boulders that we get from the telescope. So it's a, it really is an interesting question. Uh, you just don't know what aliens are going to transmit to you. Right. Yeah. Since you just talked about interstellar travel yeah. and uh, light sails, yeah. uh, and you mentioned Dr. Lloyd, uh, do you have any thoughts or opinions on the relevance of the object over the world? Yeah, that's uh, uh, <coughs> exciting. I, I said Professor Lowe has published two papers on that recently. Uh, I mean, it's what's really cool is the first interstellar object that we detect. <coughs> Part of it is it's hard to detect things. You know, it's, uh, we just now are having these all sky optical survey instruments. Uh, like it's actually a military instrument. The, the PANSARS was originally done for the military in Hawaii that searches the whole sky. And uh, uh, I think we'll probably find more. What's interesting about that one is that very strange. I mean, it's strange shape. Uh, its trajectory was pretty strange. It seemed to be directed right at the sun, uh, which is is interesting. The, you know, if it wasn't, we probably wouldn't have detected it. Uh, the uh, uh, it, it seems to have some non Keplerian motion, uh, which could either be caused by outgassing of stuff, but we didn't see a comet tail on it, so there's an upper limit on how much outgassing. Uh, or it has some funny shape that there's some light pressure. And that's what that's what what Avi Loeb's group showed that is that, that actually that if it had some light sail kind of shape, highly flattened shape, it would be more likely that it would, would have matched the projection better than outgassing does. So you know, I mean, the obvious thing is, well, if it's a light sail shape, then maybe it was made by somebody that had a light sail. Uh, the, uh, I think from my perspective, I mean, it's, you know, long gone, is that uh, we ought to be looking for others. And presumably, I mean, the predictions are that we should have a, at any given time, there should be a handful of those things flying through the solar system. And if we find another one, we start collecting data on it. Uh, one of the potential targets for early starships, chips, is to go after some of those, just to see if we can run over with them and, and fly by and get close-up data. Uh, I mean, it's uh, you know, something that then traveling in interstellar space for millions or billions of years is a lot of different things that will form in our solar system. So it's kind of, it's cool stuff. I mean, if you ask me, do I think that's an alien artifact? Probably not. But I said probably rather than mm -hmm. definitely not. I don't know what Avi would tell you. <laughs> He'd probably say probably not too. <laughs> well, thank all of you, and uh, like I said, I'd be happy to hopefully be working with you in the, in the, in the years ahead. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, next week, we'll actually have Zach Manchester, who Pete Warden was talking about in his slides. Yeah, so he'll be coming next Thursday for the next, uh, the last installation of the seminar. <laughs>